Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got a phenomenal guest today, Jim Wilson. Uh, if you don't know Jim, you will in a minute. But uh, this guy is an incredibly talented guy. I'm not blowing smoke up his ass, but he is like a triple threat. You know, he's an amazing guitar player, songwriter, and vocalist, and he really performs all three of those at a real high level. Um, and he does this across multiple genres, including rock, blues, punk, funk, metal, and even country. He's done some country record, country songs with Pearl. We'll talk about that. Uh, Jim's a founding member of the hard rock and blues band Mother Superior. The band released 10 albums between 93 and 2008. In 1999, Jim and the other members of Mother Superior were asked by Henry Rollins to back him up, and they became the second incarnation of the Rollins band from 2000 to 2002. That band with Rollins released three studio and two live albums. It's five records and another album filled with black flag songs. So that was a busy three years. Mm -hmm. In 2015, Jim, along with Scott Ian from Anthrax and Scott's wife, Pearl Aday, who happens to be Meatloaf's daughter, started a band called Motor Sister. That band's released two albums. Ride was the first one, which had 12 covers of Jim's original band, Mother Superior Songs, and then an album of all originals called Get Off. Jim's also been Daniel Lanois' bassist and vocalist since 2002, 22 years. That's like 100 years in another <laughs> occupation, right? Uh, in the late 2000s, he toured and recorded with Sparks, notably in 2008 during their Sparks Spectacular, where they played each one of their 21 albums in their entirety over 21 nights in London. He's also toured with Emmy Lou Harris, and he co-writes and records, as I mentioned, with Pearl a Day on her three solo records. And he's got a solo album of his own called Now Playing, which he made with Phil Jones, who's Tom Petty's drummer, just a very well-known popular uh, session drummer. And they had a host of guests on there, including Mike Campbell, Mark Ford, and from Muscle Shoals, Spooner Oldham. Jim's written songs and played on recordings from artists, including Alice Cooper, Meatloaf, George Clinton, Iggy Pop and Lemmy. Wow, what a uh, diversity there. And if that's as if that's not enough, he also hosts two online radio shows called The Vinyl Shelf and Radio Rewind. So if you're not familiar with any, any of Jim's work, please pay, play, bah, please pay close attention to today's chat and make sure you check out his music. He is like really in control over his tone. You can tell he really thinks about what he's going to play, his note selection, his, even his effects are like, you know, it's not the same shit every song. Like when I pick up a guitar, you know, he, he weaves it. <laughs> he, Thank you, he wow. that's, no, it's true, man. Like, you know, he, he weaves them all into like a really great sounding package, no matter what you're playing, dude. So thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Jim. Thank you. I feel like I should just leave now. That was, a, that was pretty, <laughs> that was good enough. <laughs> Let me just I tell you things. <laughs> about you <laughs> uh no, no thank I you think very I... much it's an honor to be here i love your your show thank you man thank you same <laughs> here man uh and let me just tell people i think i told you this the first time we spoke how i got turned on to jim so my son my older son sends me a um a track from uh the rollins album here illumination from uh mm. get some go again and mm -hmm. i'm like holy shit this is great and i said I, and i said who the hell's playing guitar on here? And so I call up my son. I said, man, I love this. I'm going to call this guy, Jim Wilson. I said, and, and, and first I'm going to check out his music. And then I, so I spent like, I don't know, a week and a half going through your catalog. And I'm like, oh my God. So I, you know, text my son. I'm like, you know, hey, I'm going to see if I can get this guy on my show. And I was like, Thank and you. I said, Nick, Jim Wilson's coming on my show. So it was really cool that, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. all these sources, it's like the whole, I love the serendipitousness of, if that's a word of, how music works, you know, and how you come into contact with people. It's been really cool too. Scott and Pearl have a son and he's 11, I think. And he's been discovering the stuff that I did with Henry Rollins as well. And he's been asking me questions about it. He's like, yeah. and actually when we did the get off record, the last motor sister record that came from Scott listening with his son to that stuff. And Scott said, what was your tone on that album? How did you get that tone? And I said, that's my, my strat with my Marshall, like my, you know, the things that I've been playing in Mother Superior for years or whatever. So I went back to that combo. I, I have a Les Paul too. And sometimes I love playing my Les Paul, you know, but something about that strat I've had since I was 15 or whatever. And it's just, uh, it's like every time I pick it up, it's just 
this is my guitar. Cause you go through those periods where once I started, you know, getting to tour and play around and stuff, I, you buy other guitars and, but thinking like that, I, I don't need that old guitar anymore, you know, but it's just that familiarity that, and it's got a great, um, I've had other Fender Stratocasters, same year, same uh, color. And this one is like twice as heavy as anyone I've ever picked up. It might have something to do with the great tone that it gets, you know, but, um, but yeah, I've been ever since the get off thing, I've been using the Strat again. You that's know. amazing. That's a and flame it one. A, it's like a two flame. more Duncan hot rails in it, and that's how it's a little heavier than a, a regular Strat sound. I put those in when I played with Henry. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds phenomenal, man, on all the stuff you. you do. Right, you're I'll welcome. I'll never get rid of that Marshall. It's just a magic one, too. It's an anniversary. What, what is it? It's the white one. It was an anniversary that came out in, I want to say, the late 80s. It's a 50 watt. And I just That's cool, it. man. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds phenomenal. It really does. Thank you. All right. So you grew up in Delaware. What was uh, your childhood like? What was growing up like? Um, you know, the, the I hated it when I was a kid because there was there wasn't much there. Very small town. Uh, but I had my dad uh, had a local country band s since I was you know a little kid. So there's always guitars in my house and. My dad would bring home records, and even though my parents listened to country music, I was discovering other stuff. So, I mean, it, it was there since I could read, you know. I just fell in love with the Beatles, and mostly growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, I was into 60s music. I I really loved sure. the Stones and Herman's Hermits and the Monkees and yeah. the whatever, Beach Boys. I just really liked that era. And current stuff at the time, too. But um, I guess, you know, by the time I was in high school, I knew that. And it might have something to do with my dad's band, because I realized that if I stayed in Delaware, I would end up playing music on the weekends and having a regular job. And all my heroes lived in L.A. So when I got out of high school and came here when I was 19 and just hope for the best <laughs> had no so you, money, you, had a wow. van and, mm -hmm. that's pretty that's took a lot of balls man thanks well i actually have a second cousin in riverside and he was um my mom's cousin and he was he let me stay on his couch until i could you know find a place in hollywood and and i got lucky the first job that i had when i got here was tower records on sunset oh cool yeah, so, you know, which d didn't pay well, but I made great friends and great connections and learned about the industry and the, you know, and I was, all, you know, already a record collector or whatever, but and it was kind of right when CDs were just taken off and sure. that was an exciting time to work at the record store and that place was great. And, you know, I always say this to, if you would have told me when I got here that, tower records wouldn't be there in 30 years i wouldn't i, I wouldn't be able to you know understand that because it was like no this is going to be here forever you know yeah but i met uh you know every celebrity that you can imagine while working there and coming from delaware that was so super exciting to see sylvester stallone and you know bill murray and and i had a little personal relationship with michael jackson he started calling me to make sure I was there when he came in the store in disguise because I was just like his helper and, you know, I knew where everything was and he would say, oh, little Richard or, you know, West Side Story. And, and we would just walk around the store and I would shop with him, you know, and nobody would have any idea. That's him, what? You know? it How did he wild. disguise himself? Because he's a pretty, like, well, unique first time looking guy. In, this, the first time that I was, it was a Sunday night. I was working on the register and he walked in and he had a baseball hat he had like an afro he had buck teeth he had a mustache sometimes there were band-aids on his face and he had really um terrible like uh thrift store clothes like oh, old wow. slacks and an old jacket and he walked in the and i kind of looked and looked at him and said 
who's that weird guy, you know, having no idea, you know. And then uh, he was shopping around and he had a couple friends with him and I heard his voice and I said, no way. And then I kind of figured it out. I was a huge fan. I mean, Jackson 5 were some of the first records that I bought when I was, you know, a little kid. My mom would take me to the store and say, get a 45. And it was, you know, either the Archies or Jackson 5, you know, <laughs> and Partridge Family too. But, uh, family, right on, man. <laughs> so I, you know, at, the cool thing about working at the record store too is you could, we were supposed to approach these people to see if they needed help. You know what I mean? If, you know, if someone was looking around, Bruce Springsteen's looking around, you could just say, hey, do you need some help? And then, you know, you have a conversation. So that's what happened with Michael. And I helped him that first night and um, he bought so much stuff that, Instead of making him wait in the line, I told him to, you know, go to the back room, have a seat, and we'll write. It was in the day where you had to write stuff down, you know, not in oh my computer. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So they have this huge receipt. Someone's working on it, and I would go in the back room with him, and he would take some stuff off, and he would sign autographs for the uh, employees. And I just became the guy. So he would call the store and say, is Jim there? And someone would say, Jim Michaels on the phone, and it's like, ah. I would try to like keep calm, you know. So yeah, that happened that's... eight times, and then I ran into him three other times in Hollywood, and the last time was uh, Hollywood Boulevard. He was uh, walking with a family, like a, a young girl, a young boy, and a mom, and he had a, a full burqa on with uh, his face covered and just his eyes. And I was walking with our old Mother Superior drummer, Jason. And I just said to Jason, I said, I think that's Michael Jackson walking right there. <laughs> well, he was like, like Yeah, right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I walked. I, that's great. I walked up a little bit because I had left Tower by that time. We were, Mother Spirit had started doing a thing. And uh, I walked up right next to him and I said, Michael? And he turned, he squinted like that. He turned. I said, It's Jim from Tower. And he's like, Oh. And told the family to wait, took me to the. Um, entrance of the Guinness museum there on Hollywood Boulevard. And we just like talked for 10 minutes and yeah, it was, it was really cool. Like that would have never happen if I didn't move to LA, you know, and I'm all, I always feel fortunate for the, that thing because especially after he passed, cause then it was just like, wow. And I remember seeing, um, Usher on TV talk when Michael died and, and he, they said, did you ever, you know, did you know Michael? He said, no, I never got to meet him. And I thought, wow, Usher never got to Usher, meet him. Yeah. And, you know, I had these fun encounters, you know. Just weird that he knew my name, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's bizarre. Mm. Hey, guys, if you're a musician, composer, artist, or songwriter, and you've always thought about or wanted to get involved in the profitable world of music licensing, but you just don't know how to go about doing it, then listen up. A new video has just been released that shows you exactly what music licensing is, how to get involved with it, and how to make your first placement. Or if you've already made some placements, you'll also discover how to create a system that lets you make more placements more consistently. This free training video is called Where the Money's Hiding in the Music Business, and you can find it online at musicreboot.com. This video shows you how to create the financial stability you've always wanted and how to take advantage of the current explosion of opportunities in music licensing due to streaming and the internet. So check it out online now at musicreboot.com. Very unusual and contact. Not to uh, <clears throat> keep going on it, but so that was Tower Sunset. After I worked at Tower Sunset for a couple years, I got offered a management position at Tower Records in Sherman Oaks. So it was more money. It was farther away from my, where I live, but I took the gig and I thought, man, there goes my Michael Jackson connection. And there was actually a girl that called me uh, from Tower Sunset and said, Michael Jackson just called looking for you. And I said, oh, man. So, uh, Maybe six months after working at the new one, um, somebody ran into the store and said, Michael Jackson's at the toy store across the street. So I decided to walk over there, stalker. Um, <clears throat> and as I was walking to the toy store, he was totally, this is the only time that he was Michael Jackson. Like, you know, he had bodyguards and he saw me and he's like, where have you been? And I said, I'm working at this tower. And he came the next day. 
wow. to that. I said, you should, I said, you should come to the store. And I was upstairs working. I was a manager, so I didn't have to be on the floor. And someone said, Michael Jackson's here. And I walked downstairs, opened the door. He was standing there in his costume, disguised, and said, there you are. And it was just like we did the same thing that we did to the other one. <laughs> Holy shit. That is so cool. Thanks. Yeah, I know. It is cool. I mean, what I got, an un unusual. I asked him for um, off the wall thriller and bad autographs. And I got an autograph from my parents. And then I never asked him again, you know. And it was yeah. so funny, too, because, you know, record store people, they, they're too cool for pop music or whatever. And yes. I literally, when I started working at Tower Sunset, I used to play Michael Jackson's Bad album because it was a current record and kept having hits. And uh, the whole store would just go, Ugh, all the employees would go, oh, not again, you know. But then yeah, play soon, some soon, indie stuff. Exactly. James Addiction <laughs> or whatever. And then as soon as uh, he went in the back room, they're all lined up getting autographs. And I thought, you guys. That's hilarious. <laughs> And of course, what? Like, well, I like the Jackson Five, you know, you know. But no, he was amazing, and I got to do a, through his management. I went to the Scream video premiere. I went to the Dangerous Listening Party at the Record Plant, and I went to the MTV Ten Tenth Anniversary filming that he did two songs. So I got to do that's some phenomenal. Cool... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just so he was really kind to you. He was super kind to me. And I mean, for whatever reason, I, I guess maybe it was just because I knew what he was looking for and I had musical knowledge so I could just, you know, help him out. But yeah, there was like a trust thing that he just would call before he came in just to see if I was there and available to help him out. I would, you know, they'd box everything up and I'd carry it out to his car. It was pretty cool. He would drive himself. He drove himself. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's. A, I think sometimes well, if like you're with someone at that level that you don't have an agenda. Sorry, my little cat's here. Come on, Hazel. Uh, mm -hmm. I think when you don't, <laughs> it's my little feral rescue. Uh, when you don't have an agenda, I think people really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You know that yeah. it's just like, oh, I could I'm sure disguise I was it. Just, I'm yeah. sure I was so nervous, but I mean, definitely there would have been respect there that, you know, maybe other people, I must've held it together pretty well, you know, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And I don't know there, you know, there are a couple weird. One thing I always remember too, we were, he came in on a Saturday afternoon. It was like the most busy day. And we were walking around the store shopping and we were in the regular rock and soul stuff. And, I, I feel like he was looking to Isley Brothers or something like that. And it, it was, he was standing to my left. There's me. Two girls walk up next to me and they go, Michael Jackson. Oh, no. And they were just looking at his CDs. Oh. They had no shit. idea. And we were just like frozen, like, just like, okay, play it cool. But I'm that sure is that. I'm sure he loved it. <laughs> yeah, the irony of that, you know. Yeah, Michael Jackson right here. That yeah. is, that's, I got goosebumps there, man. That was a pretty, that's pretty cool. That's and a good a story, story man. The, um, when he died uh, at the memorial, Marlon Jackson talks and he says, talking about how funny Michael could be. And he's like, I walked in Tower Records one time and Michael had this disguise on and I walked up to him and I said, Michael, you're not fooling me. But I, that didn't happen when I was there. So, but obviously, you know, that's, it was nice to hear another angle of the Tower Records and Disguise thing. And actually, something's happening right now where they're filming a Michael Jackson film uh, with the family. And I think one of Tito's sons or one of the brother's sons is playing Michael. And they built a fake Tower Records somewhere here. And I've got two messages from people saying... But it's supposed to be Tower Records in 1979, so I'm not sure what the story angle is. But uh, two people have messaged me and said, are you in the movie? It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have wondered uncle. about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, even if I should just tell somebody the stories and, like, how it really was, you know. But, oh, there was a – if you get bored of this, let me know. But I, uh, there was one time where he was in the back room. And we were waiting for them to ring up all the stuff. And uh, we had a 
a one-way window in the store, whatever they're called, like the security windows where the security yeah. guards sit up there and they watch, look for shoplifters. And he saw the little closet and the guys, and he said, what's going on up there? And I said, those are the security guys. They watch the customers. And he goes, can I go up there? And I said, uh... <laughs> and, you know, you, and the security guys were kind of separate from the record store employees, you know. So I poked my head up there and I said, hey, guys, uh, Michael Jackson wants to know if he can come up and check. And they're like, yeah, of course. And he sat up there for like 15 minutes. And he, he said to me, this is so much fun. I never get to watch people. Oh, because he can't because he, he gets spotted and he's mobbed. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of sad, actually, when you think about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like someone having I mean, to live like that. And that's, you know, I feel like that was probably a, a lonely period in his life. I mean, it was, we're talking between the bad album and the dangerous album, and he's the biggest star in the world, you know, but I can see it, you know, it's a Sunday night or something. He's just driving around Hollywood looking for something to do. You know what I mean? Go to the wow. record store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of sad. Hang on a second. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this little girl out because she's going to be all over me. Sorry. <laughs> I have a cat too. He he's, hasn't came up here yet, but... Hi. <laughs> he's like starring in more and more of these shows. <laughs> yeah, no, mine's, mine's right here too. I have one as well. Um, he hasn't jumped up here yet though. Yeah, I know. That's their cats. <laughs> That's a really cool story, man. Thank you. That's really oh, interesting. Oh, thank you. No, yeah. Let me ask you this. So you come out to L.A. from a small town in Delaware. What? I mean, you had to have some culture shock. I came out here to visit for two weeks, and I loved it, and uh, brought home tons of records, which I ended up bringing back. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you yeah, went to a tv show filming uh i was watching this show before i left called in person from the palace i think it was a dick clark production and they had live bands and artists uh and i you know walked down hollywood boulevard and it said tickets for in person from the palace so i i got to see richard marx live uh that's pretty but yeah, crazy that was cool to like start understanding hollywood you know and just the different industries and it was so different back then too it was so exciting like because sunset boulevard was split between music and movies so there were record companies everywhere all the billboards were new albums you know even if it's from sting to say you know something great white something smaller you know just everything was and now it's it's all netflix billboards when you go down sunset you know and i really do miss that that music part of it that yeah. um and there's always something new coming along and then and then when i started working at the record store i was getting you know free promotional cds and tickets to concerts and so i was loving it and it you know it happened real quick and and it was so much fun to like you know call my parents and tell them all these cool stories and they were super supportive of it of me coming out here and doing it because they knew that I was serious and I wasn't going to fool around. You know, I'm not that kind of person. I really came here because I wanted to do music stuff. And originally I thought I, I would be good at songwriting in the way of, you know, maybe working for a publishing company. I never really thought that I would come out here and have a band that just kind of happened working. I met Jason, the drummer, working at Tower Records and we both like Kiss and we got together to play some Kiss songs and then on you know maybe the second time around I was like hey I wrote this song see what you think of this you know and then that turned into a band but I'm glad I'm glad that that happened too but my uh I I was always a um I always wanted to be one of those uh 60s songwriters like you know Neil Sedaka or Carol King and Jerry Goffin yeah. you know sit in a booth and try to write songs for different artists and things but uh like a brill building sort of brill building yes exactly yeah right but right. It, i think that my music was too weird for anybody else to do in a good way you know yeah yeah and, and i didn't want to spend time copying things that were popular at the time trying to you know once i realized that was part of it too like i could easily go 
sit down and write a song that sounds kind of like Maroon 5, but I, I kind of don't want to do that, you know? I like sure. To, I like when the, the song ideas come to you that are natural. And uh, I've always kind of had that. I've always had little songs, even when I was a teenager and stuff. So I just thought that would be a good way to make money at music. And then I realized, I think, when I got here that, you know, I play pretty good comparatively, you know, seeing other bands and everybody was into Eddie Van Halen and, you know, all the rock bands were shredders and I was never like that. So, um, I think the nineties was when we got mother superior together, the three of us realized that we could do things like the music that we love, like Jimi Hendrix, you know, Hey, right. he's a trio, cream's a trio. And we kind of went, backwards and um there were a few bands the black crows that were doing that as well like showing their influences rather than trying to sound like everybody else so when that became a possibility that was a that was like okay now we have an angle and we're not embarrassing ourselves by doing songs that because um <clears throat> when you come here and you meet some guy from a record company and he's, you know, trying to tell you, write something like Def Leppard or whatever, you know. And and it makes you start thinking, like, oh, how can I sound like Def Leppard, you know? And, 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 and finally, when you can figure out that you can make your own kind of music, just like Mama Cass said, that's, that's what it, I think it's about, when you find yourself. And that took a little time, but that's okay, you know. Because there's by the time that I love so much music, like the Beatles are my all time favorites, but I never wanted to sound like the Beatles. You know what I mean? I'll use the influence in a different kind of way because whenever I hear something that just sounds like the Beatles, you know, and a lot of people go, Oh, it's great. It sounds like the Beatles. It's like, yeah, but it's just kind of a Beatles. No, I'm, I, <laughs> I feel the same way as you do. And I, that's one of the reasons I liked your band because I, I, I put it on. I'm like, oh shit! This is like '70s stuff I listened to growing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like more in the lines of doesn't sound like grand funk, but more in the right. lines yeah. of that than I, I was never like a shredder sort of fan. I want to hear. I, I want to get. I want to get moved, and mm -hmm. like it's mm -hmm. technically it's great, and to see someone with that facility, but I don't like go to bed. I can't hum that. <laughs> you know, exactly. if I'm having a shitty day and I listen to that, that's not what I, that's not going to like bring me up, but something <laughs> I can feel is like, oh, that something like... I can feel. I, that's, that's exactly it. And that's, yeah. that's the kind of music that I like and that I like to create, you know, and that's what music, music's always been that way for me. It's one of the few places that I can find like actual soul that I can feel and it doesn't happen with all music, but when it does, that's like the most truth I think I've seen in life because, um, and you know, again, there's, a, there's things that go along with it. Like I'm talking Stevie Wonder and the Beatles, you know, and mm. there's still some great stuff, but I don't know. I just, it's always been, uh, and that's why for my own music, I want that sort of quality as well so it can't really be i always say that you know i can't really write dumb down songs because it's it's too dumb for me i wish i could because then sure, i could probably sure. have you know some some stupid novelty hit or something but you know but i i just always go for um and it doesn't even have to be a certain style like you said my solo records kind of go all over the place which i like because um that's more like what I listen to myself by other people. Like it's more of the styles of music that I listen to. And Mother Superior was the same thing, but we were a band. So we had to all three be in it together, you know? And it's funny that you said grand funk because I completely understand it. But we used to be, if anybody ever compared us to grand funk back then, we would be like, what? <laughs> you know, but, but we no, but it, I mean, you know what I mean just, though? It, it, it didn't yeah, sound it happening, like grand funk, but that same, Yes. This no, is I, our it, shit. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's powerful. And 
you like it cool you don't cool you know like yeah. and that's what i like about it yeah that's what mm -hmm. i liked about it as soon as i listened yeah, to we it. were a good group and jason was a great drummer he passed away unfortunately from cancer a few years back i read that that's terrible sorry man yeah but he was a powerhouse and he was part of what made that sound you know but um we were so loud i mean and what happened was we um we started playing around hollywood and then funnily enough it's about a five minute walk from where i am right now there's a, a club that was called coconut teaser and uh the booking guy was len fagan and he loved our band and he offered us a monday night slot at midnight on monday nights free admission for our friends and we could play as long as we want and it turned into kind of a thing you know like some nights there'd be you know five people and some nights it'd be pretty packed but people always knew that we were playing there and that helped us um uh, really get good because all of a sudden we had time to fill and we didn't want to play the same thing every week so um we played coconut teaser that was i always say it's like our the, the cavern the beatles you know yeah like we played there so much and then finally uh even Ro henry rollins came to see us play there before he scooped us up so that was you know it was a good place for you could just tell people, hey, we're playing Monday. Come see us, you know. And right, to get people right. to come out on Monday nights was... At midnight. Yeah, at midnight. <laughs> but they had free hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's let, true. Let me, let me ask you this. You had said something earlier. You said, um, I came out here not to mess around, and my parents knew that. How did you, like, how were you that responsible and focused at that young of an age because it's pretty unusual i think and it's incredibly unusual for a creative i think because um some of my heroes had died like john belushi and john lennon got shot and and i don't know i just i i'm not saying anything against the dangerous element of rock and roll keith moon I just knew that I, you know, I didn't ha have a beer until I was 21 because. Oh, wow. Was, yeah. Yeah. No, for whatever reason, I was like, and maybe in my mind, I knew I wanted to be straight until I could get something going. That's incredible. And, did you yeah. have like older siblings that like, that's pretty fucking um, amazing. God, I, I wish I, I had, had that. sister, but yeah, I mean, maybe a couple like uh, uncles and stuff that I saw you know live hard lives and and who i totally loved you know uh, my dad's brother was uh he taught me a lot about music and, and different bands and but yeah there definitely there might have been an element and also my dad like i said he had a country band and he always had a, a cast of characters you know there'd be some guys that are really good and really drunk you know and then and then like you know church guys and all kinds of stuff too so i don't know i think i just wanted to get something together before i you know f found out that maybe i did want to be fucked up or you know drink a lot or something but yeah I i'm not really sure i've always Dude, been that's amazing yeah straighter side and it's Good funny for you. Because, you know when i did you know eventually i started I smoked weed or whatever and all the you know you you start if you start smoking some weed and you go oh i'm gonna smoke this every time i write songs now <laughs> and then and then you think like you, you think back when you're 18 and i didn't do anything and i was you know pretty creative i well i bought a um a tiac four track reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder when i was 18. My grandfather died a few years before that. And so when we turned 18, we got like a thousand bucks each or something like my dad's kids. So I was like, wow, I can, I can you know, buy something and start making, writing songs and, and making demos. So that's, that helped too, because all of a sudden I uh, was learning you how had to multi-track and having friends come over and recording them. And then I dragged that tape recorder out here and 
the first Mother Superior demo. There's a demo CD that came out before our CD that was recorded by me on my four track. And that's what Henry Rollins heard that, you know, made him give me a call. So that four track's come a long way. It's in the closet. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I still have it. What a good story, man. That's good for you, man. That's really good Good Thank that you were that focused, man. I, I really have a lot of respect for that. That's People like, say that, in- like, you know, and I never really thought about it. I never thought about how weird I was, but uh, this is a good example. When the last Motor Sister record came out, I was contacted by my friend from, I'd say, second to fourth grade, like when we were just kids, kids. And I would go over to his house and we would do stuff. And so I hadn't talked to him for years. And then we were talking on the phone and he said, I remember you came over one day and you said, Hey, do you want to write a song? And I said, what's wrong with this guy? (laughs) So here I am am, like probably 10, like trying to find my, my Paul McCartney, you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's awesome. I would, I would test my friends. Um, if any of my friends in school were interested in music, we had instruments at the house. So I would say, come by. And, you know, I still have recordings of some of those friends from school, just, you know, because also if I got some guy to come over and he could kind of play drums, then I could have more tracks to do other stuff. If I recorded him and I put a bass on it at the same time. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. So, yeah, I guess I was just, you know, I was just really into it. All I wanted to do was listen to music and, play records and, you know, that kind of thing and just finish school so I can, you know, make my parents happy and then get started. (laughs) And your parents must have been very like cool, like good parents, I'm assuming, because you to be that calm and focused and not have, you know. Yeah. We always shared that music thing. And my dad, my dad, he's interested in records as well. And You know, especially at the end when I was about to leave, um, you know, I was 18 and I think the bars were 21, but I could go play, I could go play in my dad's band. Nobody would ask if my dad, if I'm playing keyboards for my dad or something. Sure. So that kind of helped me, uh, raise some money before I left by doing a bunch of shows with them. And, you know, they, and of course my parents didn't know what was going to happen or, where are you going to live? What are you going to do? Where are you going to get a job? You know, I got all those questions too, but I just kind of said, it's do or die, you know? Yeah. And, Thank you, uh, man. I, <laughs> no, I Thank really, you. that's good. That's a really good story. Thanks, man. I'm really happy that's how it worked out. Oh, thanks. Um, what were the challenges early on outside of playing a midnight gig on a Monday <laughs> for uh, getting Mother Superior up and running and then booking gigs and kind of like growing? Well, it just seemed like um, for a long time, we couldn't get it to go any more further ahead. And we had lots of, we would see, there were so many bands that we would see lots of bands get opportunities and and these guys were doing a, a tour of America and, you know, oh, these guys just got signed to whatever. And we started to get some respect in, there were a lot of music papers. There was BAM magazine and there was a LA reader which had a bunch of music reviews and a couple other ones and we started to get some notice from people around town and we just kept playing and playing and then it got to the point where at the record store I had to start working part-time because I was doing these gigs and you know getting home at three in the morning and and then having to be at the record store the next morning so that changed a little bit because then I could focus a little more. And then when the Henry Rollins call came in, we, before we were part of his band, he um, heard that demo CD and he said, you know, let me know if there's anything I, I can do. I think you guys sound great. So we were, we had just recorded our first proper record and we had some good supporters. Uh, it was mixed by Bruce Gary, who was the drummer for the Knack. He, the My Girona oh, drummer. Wow. Yeah. And he was, to, he, you know, he was, he was doing the Hendrix records at the time for the Hendrix estate, doing all those compilations and stuff. So he mixed stuff and it just sounded huge, you know, and Henry did uh liner notes because, you know, we knew of his 
great writing and he listened to the stuff and i said will you write like old school like jazz album liner notes on the back yeah yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's how that started and then eventually he he produced our third album and then we became when he did our third record deep i think we didn't have any money so we had to record in i think three days i think we had three days to get the whole thing done and um to us it was like man we wish we were had time to do this you know and and at the same time henry was still with his old band and they um they took like a year to make a record and he hated it like he was like i want to work with you guys because i like you know how you guys oh. just get in there and do it you know but you had no choice. That was yeah. yeah you no didn't, it it yeah, wasn't yeah. by design. It was by like. That, what I know. Is what, I know how that yeah. is because then when you do do that, three days of recording, then you know two weeks later the drummer or the bass player says, "Oh, I don't. I fucked up right there. I wish I." Had that. And uh, <laughs> we didn't have a choice. So once the record is done and it was, you know, mixed and put on a disc, then it was just done. <clears throat> but. <clears throat> It was really, you know, we, uh, because of our Tower of Records affiliation, because Jason worked at Tower Records as well, we could use their distribution company, which was called Bayside. So oh, that's great. Yeah. So that's kind of what got our records out there because we were doing them ourselves. It was just, uh, we were led on by a, a New York Warner Brothers affiliate for like a year. And he kept saying, we're next, we're next, we're next. And we wasted all this time waiting for this guy. And then you call him once a month and he just says, oh, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. And then, you know, 12 months later, you're like, OK. Yeah, fuck that. We're done. Fuck that guy. Yeah. 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 So that's what made us put out our first record by ourselves. But you got it distributed in Tower. We got it distributed all through oh, the United States. That's and it was huge, in all man. the towers. And when I went home to see my parents, my uh, I was with my brother and we went to the mall that we used to go to when we were kids and the record store had deep the mother superior cd in stock wow when i'm I'm thinking like you know it's pretty cool like this came from my living room and you know made it all the way to some guy who, who ordered it maybe the guy knew that i was from delaware maybe he you know maybe he didn't i don't know but it you know you doesn't never do matter that. man you got a cd in a record store <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah yeah right that's pretty cool that's mm -hmm. it's funny man i spent so much time at tower and uh west fourth street and broadway mm -hmm, i mean mm -hmm. i just remember going down there and just spending hours and hours and that hours was a great store yeah yeah mm -hmm. just me too like I, uh, philadelphia know. was my first one south street had a tower records so that was like an hour away from where i lived so when i was in high school when we hit 16 you know somebody could drive and let's go to sure. tower and, but man to be able to, you know, work there. I got really lucky the day that I walked in there too. And I, this is one more stupid tower story, but it's pretty cool. So, um, I go into tower sunset, they give me an application and they said, fill this out and bring it back. So I fill it out. I come back, hand them my application at the info counter. And the guy goes, let me go get the manager whose name was Larry King, which is funny. That is uh, funny. <laughs> he let me give this to Larry. He's in the back. And I said, okay. So he takes my application. I'm standing there. And this guy comes up to talk to the guy at the info counter. Who's not there at that time and stands next to me. And I look over and it's Elton John. This is the day that I'm, you know, applying for the job. And I, you wow. Know, that ain't going to happen in uh, Rehoboth beach, right? No, <laughs> he, um, he, uh, Holy had a, shit. A, a, an account there him and Bernie Toppin, they could go into tower and take whatever they wanted and, and pay later, pay yeah. every month or whatever. That's how much stuff Elton would buy. But he used to come in all the time as well. And he, and you know, I, there was a time where I met, met Elton not too long ago and he seemed like he remembered me because, you know, I was always there, but he, the same way that I would lead Michael around Elton had, a guy that he'd been using there for years, you know, so, but yeah, it was crazy. That is wild, man. Uh, you know, I listened to an interview you did and you, and, uh, as you said, you were working in the, in the record store and you met Rollins and he basically changed your life. You said, mm -hmm. and you, you toured with him for a few years, but you recorded 
over a hundred songs and I, and I, um, I, I know you've told this story and you alluded to it, but talk about how that came about. Like when he just said, Hey, do you guys like want to be my backup band? Like, how did that go down? Like it's because uh, of the, 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 uh, the quickness of which you recorded, but like, what was your reaction and what, what, what's going through your mind? I guess. You know, it reminds me of the story. Um, we used to rehearse in Hollywood and again, we had no money. And this one rehearsal place called R and R they had, you could go in there from 11 at night to 1 AM when they closed. And for that two hour block, you can get it for 20 bucks. So, Oh my God. Once or twice a week, uh, our drummer would come over and we'd like hang out and watch like rock videos and play some records or whatever. And then, Oh, it's 11. Let's go jam. And we would just, and we were just really good at like, as soon as we kind of plugged in, we, you know, so, so we, um, had talked to Henry, Henry called me, he told me, you know, I'm thinking of changing the band and would you guys be interested? At first he said, I'm going to make a solo record. I'm going to do a couple tracks with Flea, which never happened. And I would like to do a couple tracks with you guys. But then we were, we just gelled so well that it became us. So <clears throat> the funny story, when we rehearsed at this studio, there was another friend of ours named Chops. Whatever happened to Chops, I, I don't know. Uh, he lived around the corner of the rehearsal studio. So if he saw our vans parked there, he would come over and, you know, check us out for a while. And, you know, whenever he walked through the door, it's like, Hey, so one night Henry says, I told him we were rehearsing. I said, just stop by. You know, he said, I got some song ideas. So Henry stops by and we're playing and chops walks in out of the blue. And he's, I could see in his eyes, he's going, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? <laughs> What's Henry Rollins doing here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny man <laughs> and i think you know henry had a couple um illumination here's how it kind of went down like uh henry would walk in and say i got this idea and it's just a guitar riff -da -da. and then we just wait -da. and so first i would figure out what key he's talking about and the, the riff and then we would fill out the rest of the songs. Some songs I came in with guitar riffs first and I said, I have a riff, but it went both ways. Henry was really creative and he was, um, there's a song called on the day and same thing. It starts, the riff is dun, 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 dun. so he walked in and said, dun, 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 you know, <laughs> that was his way. Of, that was his way of writing riffs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we went to Cherokee Studios and he booked it out and um, we were just fast. There was just idea after idea. What about this one? What about this one? And they all just came out really well. And then when, when it was all said and done, he picked the, you know, the 10 to 12 songs that were the ready to release. And then we would have this other batch of material from the same sessions that happened both times that we did get some go again and nice. We recorded probably 30, 30 songs at each time. Plus Henry would leave at six at night and say, Hey, I booked the studio. If you guys want to record another superior stuff when I'm gone, you can do that too. So we were recording. Oh my after God. <laughs> How cool is that? The, wow. I think the studio was getting a little mad because we were getting too much stuff. You know, we were working so fast that we were getting too much stuff. <clears throat> uh, that was really cool of Henry. It was very cool. Those oh my albums, God. Uh, the album that was released on Triple X and the Sin album were both recorded late night at Cherokee. That's phenomenal, man. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And it was nice at the beginning, too, because, you know, he didn't want us to stop being mother superior so we got to think both ways we got we got to continue what we were doing and we got to advance by doing you know super heavy stuff with henry which uh probably gave us a little bit more opportunity to do a few different kind of things with mother superior as well yeah but yeah 
and then um he was just tired of the whole thing after a while he loved uh there's a great um it's on my um soundcloud page too which we'll talk about later but uh you can listen to this podcast that henry did talking about the days that he worked with us and he said that that was the most fun he ever had in making music with anybody because we That's, were into it. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, the and fact that you're just, cranking shit out like that. So like, boom, boom, boom. You know, mm -hmm. it might've been as, as surreal as it was for you. It might've been as surreal for him. Yeah. That's interesting to think of it that way. You know? Yeah. Like, holy shit. I cannot believe what's going on. I, I mean, you know, it's like, it, you know, my last record was like delivering a baby. And now this is like, you know, yeah, oh, my God, yeah, I'm actually yeah. having fun here. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and, pretty cool. Uh, we were, yeah, we were blown away. And for the, you know, we finally got to go travel and see the world because of Henry. So that's what I mean. Like, like I was saying, like going, working at the record store and then go, getting to go like part time because we're starting to do stuff. The day I actually like quit the record store was like the best, you know. Oh my and I, god! There's a yeah. funny story. This is a I don't think I've ever told it, so it's it's a good thirty second story. So I'm working at the record store, and I give my two week notice because I know that this Henry thing is happening. I'm out of here. So two weeks goes by, and then I had off weekends, so it was Saturday and Sunday off, and my last day was supposed to be Monday. So I have the Saturday and Sunday off. Monday's there. I've already said goodbye to everybody at the record store, and they all know that I'm leaving. So I woke up and I said, I'm not going in today. I yeah, mean, right. Of course. What are they going to do, fire me? You know? yeah. So maybe around you know, 11 a.m., I get a call from my boss, Jim, are you coming in today? And I was like, seriously? Like, it's my last day. You know. Maybe an hour later, I get another call. Jim, we're just wondering if you're coming in today. And I was like, oh, man. So I didn't. And then I found out they had a cake for me and they were going to have a party. Uh, I felt so bad. <laughs> oh, I felt man. so bad. Like at first I was like, leave me alone. I quit, you know? And then I realized they just wanted to like have one last celebration. <laughs> oh man. That's, that's nice. But no, what, I, what are you going to, nobody, nobody even rem remembers that except me. Yeah. I don't think anybody's going to like, well, he didn't come in on the Monday of his last yeah, day. Yeah. yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't think anybody would come in. Yeah. Um, in the three years you were with Rollins, as I said earlier, you released six records, you co-wrote, you toured the world. What were some of the, the um, most important takeaways from that for you musically and personally? And also, once that gig ended, did you sort of like take a, a break, a well-deserved break? Um, not really. We kept We kept going trying to do as much as we could. Um, the, I think, again, it was working with Henry made us be serious and straight and the work ethic was the priority. So there, that was a big takeaway of just his, the way that he worked and there was no bullshit and there was, you know... Uh, we spent a lot of time on buses together and, you know, we all had, we listened to music together and it was, it was just great. Um, and a friendship, you know, like going, he, Henry was like us. We'd get to other towns and we'd go straight to the record stores together. He knew where they all were. Um, went to Japan with him. That was my first time in Japan, you know, and just being able to do all those things and meeting people, um, this is a great story. We, we were hanging out and Henry called and said, Ozzy Osbourne has a new record label, Oz Records. It was called OZZ. And they had a, uh, office building on Santa Monica Boulevard and they were having a party like to start the record label. And Henry got invited and he said, can I bring the guys? And they said, sure. So we, the four of us go and Ozzy never showed up. I never saw Ozzy. But um, in walks Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins. And uh, we start talking to them, or Henry starts talking to them. And, you know, they were just in Germany. And we had done a, a TV show, a, a TV thing in Germany of one of our festival shows, 
a full live concert. And they were showing it in Germany uh, a lot. We saw it on TV when we were there, you know. And Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins said, fuck, we watched that German TV thing you guys did. That was amazing. And they said, Sim Kane, who was the original Rollins band drummer, Dave Grohl said, Sim Kane used to be our favorite drummer. Now it's Jason McEnroth. And I'm wow. glad that I got to tell that story because nobody even knows that story unless you're there, you know. But yeah, those two guys said that Jason was uh, their favorite drummer at that time. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's nice, man. That's a very nice testimony, man. Mm -hmm. so, so, hey, I want to talk about some of the tracks. And I said, hey, what about the guitar player? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's our new favorite guitar player, too. <laughs> uh I want to talk about some of the tracks you've written and recorded that I really like, and this is hard to call this out. Let's start with Illuminations from Get Some Go Again. Mm -hmm. That track rocks, and your guitar playing throughout there is awesome. But what I really love is I have never, ever heard harmonics used like that in the beginning of a solo. And I thought what that was so – that's the first piece of music I heard from you, remember? And I'm like, I immediately Thanks. called up my son. I'm like, that, I got to find this fucking guy, who he is. <laughs> and I was like, I, I've never heard that. It was so creative. How the hell, like, what, like, I don't think it sound like what inspired you, but like, how did, you what know, inspired you? You know what I think inspired me is the beginning of White Wedding by Billy Idol. Because he goes, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick all harmonics. So I think yeah, but that's, that's not what... part of the solo almost. No, you, no, no. You're, true, true, you know true, what true, I mean? True. This is like that. That was like that because it was so like cool. It was like the energy <laughs> like you. poured out of immediately. And I'm like, oh, shit, this is going to be fucking cool, man. Uh -huh. Thank you. No, I mean, but, I, I'm sure there was something that made me go put that there or whatever. I, but uh... I've never heard that before or after. Uh -huh. And maybe it's because that song is so... Um hard hitting that yeah it's a very intense song that it was almost like a percussion kind of thing you know mm -hmm. that's interesting man so mm. and again that was the first album that you did with him how did your expectations differ from reality of the whole thing musically and you know uh it was there were a bunch of mind-blowing moments um from being in New York, visiting New York and hearing Illumination on the radio. Um, when we played in Philadelphia, my parents came. and Oh, that's they had, so cool. They had the Tower Records on South Street, and we were playing on South Street. So me and my mom and dad walked to Tower Records, and we walked in, and they were playing Get Some Go Again album. And that's whenever something like that happens, it's like, Hey, you know, you that's never. my boy. <laughs> 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 but the other side, it's funny too, because I mentioned that podcast that Henry did talking about it. And in that podcast, he reveals that the label hated it. And the record, they told, the label DreamWorks hated it. They told him that they hated it. And he says, I never really told the guys that because I didn't want to, you know, we were about to go on the road. And so that, I mean, that's kind of cool that I didn't that's, know that. No, it's very cool. That's the last thing you want to know. Hey, our first record together, the label hates it. Yeah, that's yeah. not really good for your confidence to they go out said, on a it's tour. It's a rock record. That was, that's their hate. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then uh, I just remembered as well um, that period was so exciting because like i said henry will call hey do you want to go to ozzy osbourne's record label party and then for the record you know we were all thin lizzy fanatics and he calls and says, hey i know scott gorham maybe we should do a thin lizzy song and scott gorham can do the guitar you and scott gorham can do the guitars and it was like oh and then <laughs> he made it happen you know and so you got so to that, jam with scott mm -hmm. oh that's pretty but, cool man and we met Wayne Kramer on that by playing on that record too. He plays on LA Money Train. And that, you know, we worked with Wayne for a few years after that as well. So I, yeah, it was I mean, Henry was always really cool and, you know, even to the point where 
here's another story I've never told before, but it feels like the time is right. Uh, I've told friends, but you know, never publicly, but, um, you know, I was, I came up with all the guitar riffs and, and most of the song ideas for mother superior and stuff. And we would all get together, but we made a thing when we got together, the three of us will just split everything, you know? So I noticed that I noticed yeah. that on the credits. Yeah. yeah. And that was just trying to keep it together as a group. So on that first tour with Henry, we were walking in the snow. I can't remember where we were, but it was snowing. We were walking to a record store together. And Henry said, you're going to split those songs with the guys? And I said, yeah. And he's like, you don't have to. And I said, I know, but we made a, we made a thing. And, but I always think that that's cool. He was looking out for me. And, and maybe as time went on, it made me realize, yeah, you know, the songs can, are more valuable than just giving them away to have people play them with you. You know what I mean? But, uh. It's just funny, but I still split them with the guys when we did it. But, uh, but it was all the records like... you've pl you've. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I noticed because I I look for that just because mm. I'm curious. You know who wrote this song? All the records you've done are like that. Yeah. No matter who you're playing with. Yeah, except for uh, my solo records are all me, obviously, and then Get Off the Motor Sister record uh, is. I think I wrote nine out of 12 by myself and I was really, that was super exciting for me because I'm, I'm open for, you know, a couple of the songs on get off Scott Ian had a, you know, a, a bridge riff or something. So he would get some co-writes, but it was, that was really cool that I, when that record came out, I was like, wow, you know, I wrote these songs and I gave them to everybody and they said, yeah, you know, and nobody changed anything, you know? So that's, that's exciting, but I do I do like writing with other people. Yeah, yeah. and especially and when, when I write with Pearl, I I we don't get together until we have the ideas together. But I just let um, songs come out that I think would sound good with her singing, and I'll write some chords and a little melody, and then I like hum a demo for her and then she writes the lyrics for those because sure she's she's singing them so i yeah you know, i like for her to have that space in it so that work, works really well too because i love writing words but sometimes it's like whew, i don't have to write the words for those you know because <laughs> well yeah especially if someone else is singing i mean it is more challenging i'm assuming yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. did you write i think i saw it on with nally colt on one of those songs yes yeah 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 mm -hmm. i had him on the show here a few years back you I did was like, wow, 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 wow. i was like Nally Colt? I was like, because again, I go through all the credits. I'm like, Nally Colt? Yeah. That's wild. He That's was, weird. We played together with Pearl a few times, but he was in the early Pearl days. He was her guitar player when I had stuff with Daniel or, or Rollins or whatever oh, was okay. going on. But we did, we did a bunch of gigs together. He's amazing. And I, you know, when I saw Pearl play with him doing my parts, I was like, wow. That dude's great, man. <laughs> like, he funny. really like understood what I was, you know, playing. Yeah, I think his band just broke up because I saw. Oh, him... they did. Yeah, I saw Something him in a post. He goes, "Hey, I've never. This is an awkward thing for me. I'm without a band for the first time in years, or something wow. like that. Wow. Yeah, this is like I don't know, like in the last two weeks or something like that. Oh man, I'm not really on social media much. It was kind of random. I saw that. So yeah, it was um, a great scene okay. in that band. Yeah, yeah, very good finger. Mm -hmm. On uh, Sin, which you talked about, Mother Superior, Fade Out, yes. Wounded Animal. I thought that was, I, it, I think it was a minor blues, right? And that, but it yes. changes keys midway mm -hmm. through, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, I feel, I'm so, I was like so nervous to tell you that. I'm like, I'm going to go out loud and say this. But I'm like, yeah, I did. My ear is pretty good, but I don't want to be like, you know, you know, like yeah. I know what's going on because I'm not a songwriter. I haven't heard it for a long time, but I know that the intro was definitely Stevie Wonder influence. Now the past is gone. Da, da, da. Yeah, now that you're singing it like that, yeah. Yeah, but with guitars. And then uh, it might have actually been two different songs, Fade Out and Wounded Animal, and then we decided uh, to fit them okay. together. Okay. Okay, so here's my question. And whenever we went to Spain, people would be like, Fade Out, Wounded Animal. Like, it, like, they really love that song there. It was, it's, it's a like, great song, you know man. <laughs> it's a great, but that title is so, like, 
odd, not odd, but it's like so uncommon. Mm. I was thinking, did did something happen? Was there like did that made you come up with the name of that, or like that was no, just? I, just I don't like ask, weird, ask about I like titles weird stuff. And uh, dude, that's a great title. Thanks. I know titles are something that I'm always looking for. You know, uh, that's it's a very important part of the song, and sometimes a title can make you write a song just because you want to hear what that title has to be about, you know? Oh yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So I, I'm always, I mean, I kind of miss my notebooks, you know, we used to carry a notebook around and writing stuff down now with our phones. Sure. We just, it's, you know, but even the cool thing about notebooks is if I go through an old notebook for something, I see all these things and the origins of all these songs. And when it's on your phone, once you're done with it, you got to delete it, you know? Oh, I didn't use that, so it's gone, you know? But uh, I was tr really trying, and I always wanted to... Um, one of my favorite bands of all time is Squeeze, the British band yeah, Squeeze. Sure. And they they have a guy, Chris Difford, who writes the lyrics, you know, like a Bernie Taupin type situation. Yeah. And I just always... I like those bands that when you actually sit and read what is being said it's like oh now i know what they're talking about you know sparks is like that too they have amazing song subjects you know so just the, the more i get to have the opportunity to write songs the more i want to make them different and always you know but i'm thinking there's always a couple songs going on every day you know it's kind of something i can't help doing and once i have a song started i'm going to finish it you know so i mean it's a good you're a thing. songwriter it's a good thing man if, yeah. if that shit stops that's when you got problems not, exactly you know <laughs> exactly yeah. mm -hmm. uh, along those lines lyrically you have a line in there my stomach was upsetting me i swallowed too much pride i thought that was <laughs> great man what was the, what, what was that all about Oh, see, I don't know. It's just me trying to trying to write a good line. That was know. a great line, dude. Thank you, Holy thank you. shit! Yeah, and, um, and know, then I, the, the rhyme helps. Sometimes you get the first rhyme or the first word, and then you say what rhymes with whatever it was before that. You know, yeah. pride or whatever. And then you say, oh, pride. Well, what can I? You know, sometimes it's like that. How can I say something that would make sense with it? You know, it was when I when we first did that very first demo CD that I was talking about. One of the guys, one of the other guys that I gave it to, his name was Michael. I can't remember his last name. He worked for Cashbox magazine. It was kind of like Billboard type magazine in L.A. And I gave him a copy. And on that demo CD, there's a lot of, oh, baby. And there's a lot of, ooh, baby. You know, and he said, <laughs> he said, uh, if I could say anything, he, he said, work on your lyrics. And I was, I was like, well, I went home like, fuck that guy. <laughs> and, but i'm so glad that he said that to me because, yeah you know, it made me realize that i can sit down and really make something out of it well you did i mean you got some great lyrics. I, I love that line my stomach was upsetting me i swallowed too much pride i was like Thank oh you. shit what's going on there uh, <laughs> but also in that track you i i you pause for like a minute and then you have like a coda at the end that's totally different from the song you're like shredding in there oh right, I, right. I, i've always you know i've you don't hear that in too many tracks but like when you hear it i always want to ask the writer why did you do that so i get this is my shot <laughs> to <laughs> ask the writer what like how did that get into your mind or like what I think anything you can tell a, me about that it was just a little piece of music um i recently listened to uh a CD that I found that was called MS Demo Notebook, and I just wanted to see what was on it. It was from the early 2000s, and there was a bunch of things that weren't that good, but that we never used, you know. And I, and I think it used to be like that. We would just uh, do everything. Like um, the guys were good enough to where I could have a list of ten things, and it's like, well, let's just run through this one. And if it was good, it stuck. If it wasn't, it wasn't. And I think that end thing was like some piece, again, that we didn't know what to do with. So it just became kind of like a um, uh, Her Majesty at the end of Abbey Road, you know, just throw something yeah. at the very end. And uh, my friend Scott Ackerman loves that little part of that thing. He always brings that up. 
but uh it was uh we were also at the same time trying to come up with riffs and ideas for henry so there might have been something in that that was like hey henry what do you think of this and he didn't respond to it so we were just like hey what about that little punk rock thing you know and let's stick it on there, yeah. We'll stick it on there, yeah. I gotta listen to Sin. I haven't heard that in a long time. There's the other thirteen violets that Wayne Kramer produced. I um listened to that after Wayne passed just to and it was it was fun to listen to because I don't you know, listen to those albums that much, but Sure. I wish they were on yeah. vinyl, but it was the C D era, so everything's, you know at the time there wasn't even hardly any vinyl being pressed, so yeah, back in the back in the end there, everything yeah. was on CD. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I love that track, man. Um, Thank you. On on from Get Off the album Get Off mm. Pain. Um, now this is with Motor Sister. Yes, I thought that um, it was a great melody, but some deep lyrics on there. And I was, if you're comfortable, is that an actual story or relationship that happened to you? Um, there's always a little bit of things, but I can, but I always make things more miserable and, um, you can go anywhere that you want to in a song, you know, hmm. and it can be part truth or whatever. I've always liked sad songs. Um, and I knew that when I had that little opening chord sequence that it would have to be a sad one and i think it probably even started as a something i was thinking as a solo thing because it wasn't super heavy but then when we got together as a band it was like oh we can really do the dynamic thing up and down and and really make the punchy parts punchy but i just uh no i mean you know things happen in my life that might inspire something but I just really got into the idea that pain is my only friend. So the only person that is around is pain, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you hate it, but in some ways you kind of like it too. You like being sad or whatever, you know, but sure. uh, it's not, you know, whenever I did some, uh, a song with Phil Jones called my dreams. And that one has, similar uh really sad lyrics i say um uh something about the leaves you know and the leaves are falling f free and you know it's real sad and, and phil jones called me he's like is everything okay and i said like, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah what do you mean he's like this song is so sad and i said no oh, okay just said, no 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 <laughs> I was trying to write like a John Lennon thing, you know, uh, uh, and so if my fun. dreams will never be reality or whatever, you know. Is everything and, okay? Uh, yeah. What the yeah. fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's good, you know. I mean, I'm a yeah. sucker for, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, I guess people probably asked Paul McCartney about yesterday, like, who's that about? You know what I mean? But it's the same thing. You can just kind of, you can make up characters and songs. You can, you know, uh, you can... If you if you're like pissed off at somebody, you can put a little message on one line for that person, and you know they'll never even know. You know. Yeah, so, that's funny. So that's it's cool. Like that's the creativity of what you do, man. Which is really thank you for letting me in on that because it's just the kind of the dime just dropped on me. That's the the creativity isn't in writing the melody; it's in everything you're doing. It's like, hey, I'm I want to create this story. You know, <laughs> I want to create. Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's, no, no, that's thank awesome. You, thank you. I spent a lot of time on lyrics and trying to make them, you know, first of all, make sense. You know, if it's, it's it doesn't have to be like a story or whatever, but it has to have some kind of meaning. And when it's a finished piece, the title should sum up what it's about, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and, and I like, relationship songs because it's easy for me and for other people to relate to i'm not very sure. good at um say like rush kind of lyrics you know like uh, songs about spaceships and things like that i'm not really good at that so my I, and for me it all comes from the blues and from country music too you know just all the um great 
heartbreak George Jones songs and Conway Twitty and you know that kind of stuff. So when, like I said, when the song is sad, like na, 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 I I go okay. Well, this has pretty much got to be a sad song, and and those Motor Sister ones came fast because um, I just uh, was so excited to have the opportunity to do another record of original material because the first one was Mother Superior songs. And we talked about making a second record and it was like, well, we need songs. And I just, I, my, I just went into this mode of like, if you want songs, you got them. You know what I mean? Let's do it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm sure people say to you something like, you know, you said you, you take a lot of time with it. And of course, you know, people, make this misconception about anything that's kind of good creatively they're like man you just crank those out and if they knew how many fucking hours you're probably spending on like i gotta get these two words they're just you know i wake yes. up at night because these two uh, it, yeah, something's yeah, yeah, you know yeah. and people don't realize what's involved in in smoothing things out the, in fact it's the opposite the better it sounds the longer it took not like you crank it out yeah, yeah i just cranked the it only out. thing yeah. that i like is when it's when there's a deadline like recording with phil jones he loves my songs and he'll say you got any songs and i'll say yeah i got a few things and he'll say let's do tuesday and i really like that because it's like i gotta finish this by tuesday you know what yeah. I mean? and uh and then sometimes you you record it and you go, Oh, I should have said that. Ah, it's, you know, there's, you know, there's a few of them. Not anything. You can say that about everything you've ever done. You know, how many yeah. like, like legit mistakes, you know, uh, I'm 60, I've made enough mistakes and I can't sit here and say, I mean, I, I wish I would have done. It's like, all you got is now, man. You know, it's yeah, like yeah, you do yeah. the best you can when you're, when you're w with the tools you have and any given yeah, time. And there's always going to be a, another opportunity to do yeah. something different next time, you know? Yeah, definitely, man. Um, the vocals are great in that track too, is and so is the outro, the solo that you have. Is that you and Pearl singing together on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really good. Thank um, you. And then talk and about that a comes from working with all the with all the years with Daniel and and touring with Emmy Lou and stuff too. I've I've got really good at at writing melodies that ha can have harmonies, you know. So it, it when we did the Get Off record, I said to Pearl, I said, let's try to sing as much together as we can like if there's a harmony available let's put all those in there yeah well this is that was beautiful at the end of that track man thanks and then off of the pearl record little immaculate white fox this song mama mm -hmm. was that like about a dysfunctional mother I, i'm going to stop asking you what your lyrics are about now well that's that's just... pearl's lyrics that's pearl's okay lyrics. that was um, a great well, yes, ballad i think man. it is <laughs> <But>. <laughs> I don't want to um, speak for her, but um, but yeah, we still play that one. It's so it's great song, powerful. man. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You did something. I don't even know if you remember this, but at the the way you played the bar chords on there, you know, especially towards the end. You know what I'm talking about? Like yeah. most people would have just like you know played a bar chord and bar chord and let it ring for 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 two beats. Mm -hmm. You broke it up. You know, like Thanks. you maybe did like a, a, a dotted eighth or then like a, or a you know, dotted eighth and then a 16th at the end of the second beat. Yeah. And it really made a huge difference in that track. I don't, was thank you. Like, do you know what I'm talking about? I do, was, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was, was really weird. cool. Because I use little, little figures on the, on the high strings. And I think, you know, some of that is Pete Townsend influence too, because there's some great who songs where the bass will just be driving on a D and he'll be putting all these chords behind it. You know, he's, he's so, phenomenal. He's yeah. an amazing song. I think a lot of that guy. stuff just... came from like, it could be clean, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And then still have the heavy open D over top of it. Yeah. I noticed that cause it made a real huge difference in the, just the power of that, the, the vibe of that track, man. Yeah, that's a good one. I like Mama too. Yeah. Top three musical experiences you've had, Jim, and what made them so much fun? Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, recording all night with George Clinton was pretty amazing. That was because I remember waking up the next morning, going, 
I recorded with George Glenn last night. What was that on? Nothing has been released. No. We did songs for a, a Funkadelic record. And I saw George at NAMM maybe five years ago, right before COVID or whatever. And he said, it's coming out. And it still hasn't come out. How did you even get that gig? Henry. Oh, wow. Henry, uh, and there's a track with Henry, too, called Ass Wipe. I have a rough mix of ass. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> And we did a. And then you call your mom home. with that one. Hey, mom, <laughs> yeah, yeah. check out this track I wrote. <laughs> and we did a we did a <laughs> funk version of Whole Lot of Shaking going on because George said that was the first record that he ever bought, and I wow. would love to hear that. Yeah, that would be amazing. And so Asswipe came out on YouTube, a completely different mix from what I have, and the person who put it on YouTube said unreleased George Clinton with. Anthony from the Chili Peppers. Well, it was Rollins. So I got in touch with the guy on YouTube. I said, where did you get this, number one? And number two, that's not Anthony. It's Henry Rollins. I'm playing yeah. guitar on this. And he said that he bought some... Somebody bought some reels of outtakes from George Clinton. And they were just like, you know... He he had like five or six other tracks. And he, and he let me hear them. And I said, no, none of those are me. Damn. So, you know, it was that's it weird got mixed for something and it just, and the, but the version that's on YouTube is there, but it doesn't sound that good. It sounds thin and you know, it's not, the, it's not a real mix, but, uh, though, I don't know. It was, that was just like, you know, I've been a parliament funkadelic fan my whole life. So just knowing that happened. And I know once we hang up, I'll say, Oh wait, I forgot about whatever. But again, Japan, I, as a record collector, I always collected japanese pressings and yeah. to be able to go to japan and play i've been to japan eight times now different acts like twice with henry twice with sparks daniel terry reed mother superior toward japan but that to me is like it feels like yeah I did something you know what i mean and if people if these music fanatics in japan are know of your existence then things are good you know yeah that's pretty cool did you buy any guitars there man because there's so I many i never cool did i don't even think i've been to a music shop i'm always going to the record stores there and yeah, yeah. Clips. and by the time i spend all my money on records then i'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> what am i gonna eat <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um and the sparks the playing 21 albums with sparks in london i was in sparks fan club when i was in delaware you know in high school and they were my favorite band um oh my god so that was like a fantasy come true for you i mean my whenever sparks were on tv i would make my family like sparks coming on you know and so yeah, yeah that was that back was, in the day when you had one tv in the house yeah, right yeah yeah, yeah and of you had course. to catch it live yep yes right but that's cool they you know i did a little bit i played on a couple sparks records and uh did um the original thing was uh i met Mother, it's getting turning into a long story, but Mother Superior did a song called Four Walls, and Tony Visconti, who produced Sparks and Bowie. Lizzie and Bowie and T Rex, he did a string arrangement for us on that song. And then he was super cool. He would come to the Rollins Band shows, and he mentioned, I told him that Sparks is one of my favorite bands, and the record that he did, Indiscreet, is like their white album, you know. And he's like, Oh, do you know them? I said, no. And he's like, oh, you should know them. And I thought, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Noted. So, yeah. So then <laughs> months later, he's in LA. Tony's in LA. And he says he's having his birthday party at this Japanese restaurant. And he invited Mother Superior. And I thought, okay, LA, I bet you Sparks are going to be there. So I actually had to sit next to Russell, the lead singer of Sparks, the first time that I met him. And I'm like, you know just fanboy and i'm trying, trying to not cool. to be like yeah right right <laughs> and we exchanged numbers and then they got asked by uh morrissey to come do this their 1974 album come on to my house in london for his meltdown festival he curated morrissey did so um i i just casually said to russell well i know the album by heart if you're looking for anybody and he said we're looking for lead guitar and i said Psh. so i went over there and i had to audition to Russell just playing along with the uh, CD 
and uh, got the gig. And then after doing some gigs with him and stuff, he, he called and said, we have this crazy idea of doing tw- all, we've, they're about to release their 21st album. And he's like, we want to do every album, you know, one album a night. And they were like, we can't do it without you. And it's like, well, tsh- I know it. I know them all, you know, so. Wow. I mean, I didn't know them. That's a lot of shit to learn, They're, man. They were all here. I know every song, and I've listened to them a lot, but I, I did have to sit down and, like, figure yeah, Knowing out. the song and playing it or not, you know, there's a lot so more to, fun. yeah. And, I mean, wow. for a fan like me, like, when we started the first couple nights, nobody knew who I was. And they would, you know, the show would finish with the crowd going, Ron, 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 and Russell, Russell, Russell. And by the end of the whole thing, there were gym chants. And ah, oh, that's so cool. There was a group of Sparks fans in the front row that started the Jim Wilson fan club, and they all put on, they had these fake beards that they put on. They'd be in the show. <laughs> it was amazing. That is so cool, man. That's really cool. <laughs> so that was, you know, to be accepted like that and to, to be able to say, yeah, pretty much any sparks record that i listen to i like i played this on stage you know yeah that's awesome man <laughs> that's also you know i'm a marketing guy and as soon as i read that that they did 20 that's such a great marketing ploy too because if you got a diehard fan each of them are going to have like five favorite albums they've got to see yes so like you know i'm going to go i've got to you know it's a great way to sell a lot of tickets man mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. really there's a very golden clever. ticket too where you can get but not everybody could take a whole month off work and be there for but a few people did but then i met like you know joe elliott from def leppard is a huge sparks fan and i he came for the two albums that he loves kimono my house and propaganda and that led to us being friends i mean the first night that i met joe we went back to his hotel and we were drinking at the bar together and and now he plays my stuff on his radio show and you know he he, when Def Leppard did the the tour before the stadium tour, um, he got the crew so into Motor Sister that he said, I didn't want to tell you this, but they're setting up our stage every night to the Motor Sister album. That was oh, their like, awesome. go-to like listening thing. And Joe's been so cool to me. And, uh, you know, he loves Motor Sister. He loves my solo stuff. Uh, when he played my solo thing on his radio show, for through my eyes, he said he played with Sparks, and then he plays, and he's got a fantastic solo career. And it was like, yes, I got a fantastic that's really solo nice. career. <laughs> that's cool. Uh-huh. I had I had Phil Phil Collin on the show. He's a pretty funny, funny. I've only guy. met Phil <laughs> once, but yeah, yeah. That's the thing with Def Leppard too. When you go to the shows and you go backstage, Joe has his own dressing room and his own bus, so I never like see the other guys. It's always just like I hang with Joe. <laughs> Right, but I did meet right. Phil once, and he was super nice. Yeah, he, he was very Great funny, player. actually. Yeah, he's a mm-hmm. real guitar player. Um, okay, so, okay, it's Bootsy, um, Sparks, and the second one was, I'm sorry, uh, Going to Japan. Oh, Japan, yeah, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. very cool. Uh, what do you think, which of your personality traits do you feel have contributed to your success or allowed you to become successful? Patience. Um, is that a personality trait? Or yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because if because you I've somebody, always, yeah. I mean, I've always had. Um, That's great. I've always known what I can do, and I always felt like it. I, I don't want to be show offy or anything. So just do it as it comes. And yet, again, like through the years you see things that you think you see a band and you go oh man they're really good and and then they break up and you never hear from anybody again and so i just pacing and patience and Dude, you're wise beyond your years even when I, you were little yeah. that's no because let me tell you man i didn't get patience till like in the last maybe seven years maybe 10 if i'm really lucky so when i hit 50 maybe i started getting patient but mm-hmm. that's really not that i'm the barometer for like humanity but no i, I mean you know and i can i, I can say patience. that i don't i never i never knew what was going to happen or, or how it's going to happen but something always happens which has kind of made it continuous like when henry says i don't want to do music anymore 
then, you know, I meet Daniel Lamois and, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm playing bass in his band and then meeting people who think I'm a bass player. And, 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 <laughs> you know, it's funny. We were talking about the coconut teaser. Um, and I've been playing some gigs with Mark Ford playing bass for him. And some guy came to see us and I was talking to my friend, Brian, after the show. And this guy came up and said, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you guys, but I just want to say, I, I really love your bass playing. And I said, Oh, thanks. And, uh, he said, I've been following Mark. I saw him play at the coconut teaser. And then my friend Brian said, uh, Oh, coconut teaser. That was your place, Jim. And he's like, and the guy goes, Oh, what, what was that? What band? I said, mother spirit. And he goes, Mother Superior, that guy was a great guitar player. It's like that was me. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny as hell, man. Oh my god, that's a new present of your fan club, man. Yeah, that's for sure. I just did a, a, you know, the session that I did last week. I was playing bass, and same thing. Like you know, people are just taking note of my bass playing, and so that Daniel is, is that that means a lot to me. I played guitar with Daniel when I first started, but he wanted to be a trio, and there's not much to do on guitar when you play with Daniel because he's so unique and, and great. You kind of want to be out of his way. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, sure. that helped with um, learning funky bass lines. But yeah, I think that that's, that's been my thing. I try not to burn out and I try not to panic. I've seen so many musicians panic through the years that I, um, I have a thing that I tell my friend Anna about that, you know, it's a, I call it the Monday. I don't do Mondays because so many years of, I know all my musician friends spend their whole weekend thinking, what am I going to do this week? And Monday is like the day that you would get all the calls from everybody going, we got to do this and we got to do this and we got to do this. You know what I mean? It was always like the panic day. So I, yeah. I usually let Mondays kind of just go by if, and then like, don't worry about anything. And I always, I always try to, you know, it's always in the back of my head to, keep making new songs and keep, you know, make sure you got recordings going, but things have been between the motor sister record and then through my eyes, which I put out last year with Phil Jones, you know, I've, I've put out a couple records in the past couple of years, like with brand new, fresh stuff. So that's why I've, uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm working on a new record with Pearl and that's really fun because uh, it's, it's always nice to write for situations, you know, and, uh, and she's a big fan of, I mean, that's how it all started with us playing together. She, they were, her and Scott were Mother Superior fanatics. Yeah. They used to come to shows. I remember they came to see us in uh, Colorado. Like, you know, if they were in town, they would just pop up at a gig. And, you know, that always meant a lot because I always wanted to be one of those bands that musicians liked as well, you know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. And Look, um, so we, we got that come in and lots of new stuff. Always. So let me ask you this. You've always had this sort of patience and this sort of almost like, hey, something will happen. Something, you know, something good will come along. Again, you don't, it's, if this is too personal, you don't have to answer it. Mm -hmm. Are you like a spiritual guy? Like, are you, do you have some sort of a higher power or do you feel <laughs> like that's looking over you? And again, if, if you're not comfortable, that's totally cool. But Well, no, I mean, to be honest, I feel for sure that um, I don't want to say someone, something's looking out for me, but I feel like whatever gift or talent that I was given that I, it, if I use it the right way, then, and then, you know, I, I do somewhat believe that I don't think I could do all these things by myself, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So a hundred percent. I do feel a little bit guided sometimes. I'm like, I was just talking about the panic situation. I remember a different drummer friend of mine saying to me, well, nothing's going to happen if you don't, you know, make it happen. It hasn't really been that way for me. Thing, things have kind of like happened that make me go, okay, I'm doing the right thing because something good just happened. Um, but making and, it happen, it takes a lot of different forms. Yeah. And I'm not you know, really aggressive with it. I'm, I'm not like, right. I want, you know, I'm going to call this guy and I'm going to say, hey, we're, you know, 
I, I, I'm, I think I'm more confident enough that it's like Daniel says, uh, if you do good work, it always comes to the surface. So right. even, even all those old records that we made, I'm happy that, you know, people like them and respect them. And, um, it's always weird when someone says, you know, your album from 1998 is my favorite one that you ever did, you know, because then it makes you feel like, well, you didn't like anything from the last two, <laughs> <years."> <laughs> Yeah. But damned if you do, damned way. if you don't. They and if you say, hey, way. that album you did last year was the best thing. What the <laughs> fuck? I have 25 years of it. That's all? <laughs> 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 right, it's just right, like right. The, the inner critic you know coming yeah. out like yeah i feel you on that no, the no, reason I, mean, I, asked I, you that... I definitely believe um you know that something uh helps you know yeah and, 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 and you know i'm never and spiritual is a good word i mean yes yes i'm spiritual you know i don't i don't it's not something that's written down or that I can explain, you know, but, uh, um, yeah, I don't mean like religion, like Judea, yeah. in the Judeo Christian sense of, mm -hmm. I meant spiritual, like a, a belief in something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause like yeah. I said, I don't, I don't feel like I, like even when someone says, how did you do that? How did you move out here? And I don't know, I, you know, and then, you know, just of all the little, little breaks I have. And then sometimes you go like, Oh man, what's going to come next. And, and there's nice surprises that I could have nothing to do with me making something happen, you know? So, right. So, yeah. I just the reason I asked you that, too. well, the, the reason I asked you this, because I find most people that have that sort of inner peace that are like, not like super aggressive or like fucking mental about, you know, oh my God. I mean, look, we all have good days and bad days. I'm not talking about that. But you mm -hmm. seem like you've had like a very, a, 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 um, a confidence and a belief that you're going in the right direction. And I find people that are like that. Number one, I'm, I tend to be more attracted to them. But number two, they are, they tend to have some sort of spirituality and, and mm. gr grounding or, or, or humility. I heard something just like last night. Someone said, uh, <laughs> You're either humble or you're on your way, you know, like, mm -hmm. like you're on your way to being humble. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I find the people that are like that are humble people, you know, uh, that have that inner peace. And there's no need to be like, you know, you know, like you said, oh, I was so lucky. I play. I got to do those sparks. You weren't like, yeah, I play those sparks gigs, you know, 20. <laughs> you know, there's a big but there's a difference and different mm -hmm. people will position that differently. You it's, know, you know. I have a really good music friend from high school, uh, my closest friend in high school, and his favorite band was U2. My favorite band was Sparks. And this other guy that we used to hang out with, Mike, his favorite band was Black Flag. And those guys say to me, like, you fucking work with Daniel, you work with Henry Rollins and Hayden <laughs> Sparks. Like, what? You know. It wasn't, I wasn't even, that would be an impossibility when, when, if that conversation would have never, if I was standing in that room, we were all sharing our records, I would have never said, I want to work with all three of these guys in a few years. Right. You know I mean? Well, that's what I'm talking about, though. You just put one foot in front of the other and yeah. you just said, hey, I, I believe I'm doing the right thing and I'm walking in the right direction. And if I'm not, I'll get a message and I'll walk in another direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I, I guess I, I know like what that. I do, which is basically guitar and singing. And so, you know, just stay true to it. And just like I said, like Daniel said, just do good work, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate you answering that. Mm -hmm. Low points, Jim. What were some low points or dark periods you've had to deal with, and how'd you get through them? I can't really say anything's been low. Um, you know, even... Mother Superior coming to an end, it, it just kind of had to end. But I immediately, it opened up the thing for me to make solo stuff. And I know that some people missed the sound of Mother Superior, but then that was kind of taken care of by Motor Sister. So I don't, I didn't really, and then I was, 
when that when Mother Superior fell apart, I was touring with Emmylou Harris, so it wasn't low. You know, it was like, wow, I'm, I'm You're touring with Emmylou Harris. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just met Linda <laughs> Ronstadt last night. Things are good, you know. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. The lowest period for me, I think, was the very just beginning of trying to make connections and you know um trying to get people to take you seriously or again i was straight off the boat from delaware so like i would meet these guys at tower records that were in bands and they were like already you know rock star ready and uh at first you're like you know i'm not as cool as that or whatever but like I said, those kind of things come and go. Whereas yes. good music lasts, you know. So if the guy is like a popular, good looking guy, then that doesn't mean it's gonna be like that forever, you know. So that was something I kinda Yeah, that's more like high school shit anyway yeah, to yeah, tell yeah. you. Uh -huh. You know, it's like, you know. Yeah. But man, I don't know. I can't really I mean, I'm totally good. being honest too. Yeah, I just you know other than maybe some bad girlfriends or something, but that's no big deal too, you know? Sure. sure. <laughs> well, dude, I hope that continues for you. That's a really Thank good, you. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, ever sell a guitar you wish you can get back? Nope. Uh, not really a, you know, a uh, guitar collector. I have my Les Paul and my Strat and uh, a couple others. That's a Les Paul Deluxe, mm -hmm. right? The gold top? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. I love that. So guitar. I've never really been a, um, a, a buyer of guitars. I'm more uh, a vinyl collector. So I definitely have some records that I sold that I wish I didn't, but I have a really like, good record collection too. Like, what did you say? What record did you say? Um, just dumb things, probably that I've replaced. But when I first drove out here as well, uh, I had a Dodge van that I drove from Delaware to California, and I had. On the on the back of the van, I had rows of vinyl, and then I went through Texas, and there was a crazy rainstorm, and I learned that there were holes in the bottom of the van, uh, so I lost a ton of records coming out here. That sucks. Mm -hmm. That sucks. <laughs> but yeah, I still, you know, and it's really great having the radio shows because I get to actually share all this stuff that I have too, and I get to play my records more than I would if I didn't have my radio show, you know? Yeah. I've read an interview that you did and I could see like the joy you have about those shows of just, you know, how, you know, just cause you're such a music fan and a vinyl fan. It was yeah, nice. I can't believe that. people yeah. listen. Cause I play such weird, I mean, I play normal stuff too, but I play weird stuff as well. So I'm, I'm really happy that people pay attention. What, what's the first album you ever bought? Do you remember? Not really. Cause they were always, and like I said, my parents were always, uh, I remember. Oh, okay. Right introducing the Beatles and my, my dad always had records like Elvis and stuff. So, but I, I remember getting, um, the, the Beatles red album, which my mom sent me a bunch of old, uh, birthday cards and stuff. And it, it was my fifth birthday and my mom got me the double red 62 to 66. And oh, that's so uh, thoughtful, man. I yeah. Was, that's a, and I guess That's... I was already like obsessed and I was really into like what songs are hit. Like if I saw an album, like what songs are the hits? That was my main question. And my mom looked at the Beatles record and she said, Oh, these are all hits. And I just thought, <laughs> this is my band. <laughs> so that was when I was five. And that's, you know, that's the earliest proof I have of like, this was actually like my record, you know? So, and that's a good answer. So I'll say Beatles 60, but I bought 45, like my mom, she would buy four, you know, Conway Twitty and Tammy Wynette and stuff for herself. And then she would say, you want to pick out a 45? So it'd either be, I mean, Three Dog Night, Grassroots, Jackson 5. Those are the ones that, that I liked when I was pre-10. Yeah, those are all, that was all great music back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So this is probably gonna be the toughest question for you. Top three Desert Island disc, just for now, just for this moment, because I know that it, obviously that changes all the time. Yeah. Um, okay, just for now. Yeah. Beatles White Album is always my go-to Beatles. And I, if it right. was up to me, the other ones would be Beatles too, but I'll spare us for a moment. 
And I'll say Squeeze East Side Story. It's one of my favorite albums ever. And The Police, Synchronicity. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great record. Mm -hmm. I had Andy Summers on the show recently. It was oh, man. Interesting talk. Yeah, it was interesting talking to him. It was kind of funny. Um, and then I yeah. have uh, different, um, what's, what's his, the guitar player's name? A uh, whole uh, Tilbrook. Oh, Glenn Tilbrook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's coming. He's supposedly coming on here in a few months. Oh, so I'm excellent. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good, good, good. To that one. Yeah. He's an Dude, amazing you, guitar player. You know what, man? When uh, I'm putting the questions together for that, um, I'll shoot you an email or a text. And if you got a question, I'm going to ask him because you're such a that. fan. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. That'll be good. That'll be good. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you, you, it sounds like you really love him. So, yeah, I do. I, yeah, and I, I already thought of a good question. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most important lessons you've learned from getting older. Slow down, um, and don't like in strange places be straight like i you know i just the uh, there was one time i was in russia when i was in sparks and we ended up at some party and i like you know fell or something you know just stuff like that so i i think slow down is a good answer just like take it easy you know yeah no need to rush yeah all right tough question what do you like most about yourself <laughs> <laughs> i don't know um i mean um, i do know uh i like to think that and i've had a couple friends tell me that i'm funny and mm. that almost means more to me than like somebody saying you're a good songwriter because you know i love um steve martin and Richard Pryor and Lenny Bruce and all the classic comedy stuff. So a lot of that, and I read none magazines. of which could be aired today. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We've really come a long way, haven't we? It's but not the, not the right direction. <laughs> I know, I know. But I like to think, like, if you get to know me, if you're my friend, we'll have some pretty funny conversations. Cool, cool. Most important thing you learned from your dad. G. And then G chord. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I mean, pretty much. And, you know, he's my dad's a pretty good singer. He's got a, you know, a good kind of low country voice. Uh, and a lot of that stuff. I'm not saying that. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, I would never. I never wanted to sing like my dad or whatever, but. It, he taught me a lot about music and he fed that thing that I was feeling, you know, and it was always supported. That's so, awesome. Mm -hmm. And he's, that's you know, an... he's very proud to this day. You know, he, that's if awesome. you meet my dad somewhere, he'll be showing you the motor sister album, you know, that's really cool. That's the yeah, number my one. My parents are cool. Number one commonality between successful musicians is that they had, I mean, in my you know, population of almost a thousand people I've interviewed. The number one characteristic is they all had supportive parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by a long shot. How about no, your mom? Good. Most, yeah, most same important thing. thing. My mom is the yeah. same way. You know, and they 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 feel the same way, and they they're just so happy that I do things and uh, that I actually made some things happen. You know, and I'll see them like I'm going to the East Coast with Mark Ford in may and they're going to come to that show and I'm, it'll be cool to oh that is nice that. mm -hmm. that's really cool so uh besides typing do you have any hobbies or interests <laughs> outside of music <laughs> <laughs> that one always gets out there your uh, typing prowess precedes you <laughs> yes <laughs> um no it's pretty much all music yeah especially since between playing and like doing my radio show because i would i would say I really enjoy putting the radio shows together too, but that's still more of the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, and typing just comes along. It just helps with the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the radio stuff and the blog and the, 
But dude, typing, you know, they, did you get, you took typing and they used to teach it in, in school. We had to take typing. Yeah, just, me too. For whatever reason, I was just like, it just made sense to me and I was just, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I know. used to win uh, my years in high school. I always won the best typist. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. My kids will be like, dad, how'd you get so fast on a keyboard? I'm it like, was crazy I know this. Like, you know, I, you go, yeah. you're in 12th grade and they, right. go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, my kids are always like, how did you get so fast? I'm like, I took typing in school. And they're like, <laughs> watch. They don't even, they've never even seen a typewriter. Except maybe so an old one we had grade, here. When I'm, you know, they're trying to have the guidance counselor, you have a meeting to find out what they, what you're going to do with the rest of your life. They're all <laughs> trying to get me to be in an office job, you know? And I said, nope, going to LA. <laughs> I should probably get going soon. I hate to cut us off. Are, are we? Uh, yeah. I, two questions left. Two okay, questions great. left. Awesome. Uh, uh, Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, Jim, and has that change been intentional or just a natural part of aging? Always intentional, trying to be better, a better person. And um, I think I just, uh, I have a lot of really good friends right now and um, just a the respect that I get is always satisfying. And um, again, I hate to say patience, but that's, that's a big one. You know, I, you know, I think the patience helps on all parts from helping things to happen and not ruining things. And, but yeah, just being a better person, you know, and I, uh, be it personal or, professional you know i want to sing better and play better and and you know be nice to people thanks man mm -hmm. well let me let me tell people where to find you what you got going on uh first of all we need to talk about the a lot about the music you did with phil jones but um yeah jim's got a record he did with phil jones the drummer two that now mentioned, or, two now that's right mm -hmm. when is and is Through and, my eyes uh, and now playing okay and you can get those, uh, go to wilsonjones.bandcamp.com. It's Bandcamp Wilson Jones. So go to wilsonjones.bandcamp.com. Also, you can check out Jim's radio show if you go to SoundCloud and look up the vinyl shelf. It's on there. And you can find follow him on Facebook under Jim Wilson, Instagram under Swingin' Pipe. Yes. S-W-I-N-G-I-N pipe. I'll let you leave that story to your imagination. <laughs> and also, if you are interested in working with Jim, uh, doing having hiring him to do some sessions for you, either guitar, bass, or vocals, you can email him at topbeat, T-O-P-B-E-A-T -E at AOL.com. Uh, just please send him like maybe a demo of the music and what you're looking for so he can then get back to you intelligently and say oh yeah this is a fit for me or no it's not a fit for me but here's somebody maybe you could be looking into that sounds so just great. be thoughtful and respectful of his time and uh that's that any uh final words anything else i missed anything you want to promote that i, that I left out um no but uh, the, I, there is a brand new single too it's a digital single with me and phil jones it's called uh never go back and uh it's really nice and eventually we have another batch of um single songs that we're going to release throughout this year and then have a compilation of them for an album or a cd for next year but there's great vinyl stuff on phil's band camp page and you know i appreciate everybody for this support and thanks for listening right on music. man lots well, more check, to come check all that out and uh and and if you haven't D dug into Jim's catalog, go, at, go in and do it. You'll appreciate it. Um, man, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you, your time. It was uh, great. Great conversation. Uh, thank you. Cool. Same here, man. Make sure you hit me up if you come to Tampa. Yes. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, share it on your socials with your friends. We appreciate your support. Thanks so much to Jim Wilson for spending time with us. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Jim, thank it's you so much, excellent. brother. Hang on one sec.